but uh, but yes, you know the, this this idea that technology doesn't create itself currently. Like we need humans to create those technologies, um, and and my my book I think is very important because it captures those stories from the, those geniuses, which which are valuable in itself. It's like nuggets of knowledge and inspiration. But if you look at them broadly, you you do see patterns. And uh, I did I did identify this pattern of, of my genius theory. It's sort of a recipe for genius to create new geniuses. But there are other patterns as well that are of value in, in those stories. But uh, you know, w- one of my first points is give encouragement, validation, and self confidence to the genius. You can do it. So I, I actually have a story from uh, Vint Cerf. I'd love to share with you, um, sure. Socrates. So so this 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 is almost a. Uh, a, a specific example of what a teacher could do. Like, you know, this is independent of Singularity University. This is just one teacher in a classroom. And, you know, if that teacher identifies a student that uh, he or she thinks is amazing, she could do something like this. So this, this story comes from Vint Cerf, and I call it Expression of Confidence from the Teacher. And so this is about Vint Cerf, who's the father of the internet, when he's in just fifth grade, and he's getting bored with school. He, like, school is too easy. He Like, what... Uh, he, he's starting to lose interest, and he and he and he approaches the teacher, and he's like, "Look, this is boring. Like, I want more." And and here here's Vint Cerf. The first memory comes in the fifth grade. I'm bored with the fifth grade math book, so I went to the teacher and I complained, and I said, "There's got to be more than this addition, subtraction, multipli- multiplication, and division." So he said, "Yeah, there is," and he gave me a seventh grade algebra book. I took it home over the summer and worked every problem in the book, and I loved it. The word problems especially. It was sort of like an Agatha Christie novel. You had to figure out what's X, you know, who done it. So I enjoyed the problem solving. I enjoyed especially formulating the equation from the word problem. It was pretty. It was this terse expression from this long narrative. You could put it together. And because it was in that form, it became, how, uh, it became clear how you went about solving the problem which taught me that problem expression is sometimes as important as figuring out the solution. If you don't have the problem expressed in the right form, the solution won't become apparent. Transformation of variables is one of the most power- powerful tools in mathematics. It has the side effect of transforming a problem that you don't recognize into one that you've already solved. So it's a very clever tactic and one I still believe in today, not just for mathematics. So I learned a lot from that experience in the fifth grade. And I would say that it had two direct impacts. The first one, of course, was just getting to do the algebra earlier than I would have otherwise. It stimulated my interest in mathematics. This, but this was also an expression of confidence from the teacher, someone I respected, that I could actually do the math, that I could do it on my own, building up my self-confidence. We sometimes call that mathematical maturity, although I hesitate to use the term in the context of seventh grade algebra, as opposed to some serious tensors you'd find in Riemann geometry. So it was a very foundational kind of experience. And obviously the fact that I recalled it now means it stuck with me a very long time. So, so just, just picture that. Imagine, imagine yourself in the fifth grade and being bored with school and then a teacher saying, look, I believe in you. I think you can do seventh grade math. And think about how uh, inspiring that would be. And, and so that, that confidence from when he was just a little kid stayed with him. And he ended up actually going to Stanford and doing a, a degree in mathematics I, I incidentally, incidentally did a, a degree in mathematics from Stanford. And he goes to UCLA, meets Bob Kahn, and ends up writing the TCP IP paper that was the br- blueprint for the internet. So, I mean, uh, the, t- the teachers play a very uh, foundational experience, but it's not just teachers. It's also, uh, you know, role models, uh, parents. Uh, Rita Colwell, who is the first female director of the NSF, talked about how her father was very instrumental in encouraging her because at that time women weren't supported in science and technology, but, but her father believed in her and, um, and said, look, you, Rita, you're going to go to college um, and you're going to be amazing. So, um, so those, those kind of uh, uh, examples you know, other people could emulate and help inspire the next generation of, of geniuses and technology. So, Greg, you had some pretty unique access to some of the most incredible people of technology who yes. have impacted progress in our civilization for the last two or three decades. Um, perhaps you'd like to share a couple of your most favorite stories with us today, um, given that uh, our audience is very singularity uh, interested. Uh, perhaps we can say one with Ray Kurzweil and one with somebody else. Mm-hmm. If you yeah. May. 
Yeah, I, I would love to share some stories with you. But also I'd like just to make a point of, yes, I did have access to these amazing people, but – uh, but the, the readers can also have access to these people by, by reading my book and listening to these stories. But it's also amazing how open these people were to talking. They're, they're not like you know, celebrities like you know, Britney Spears or something. They actually will talk to you. And if you have questions, you can email them. And you might even be able to get, to get together with them for coffee. So I, I'd encourage readers, if they're uh, inspired to talk to them, you know, give it a shot as well. Um, so the first uh, story I'd like to read is, Actually, uh, from Rita Colwell, who's, who was the first female director of the NSF, and she won a National Medal of Science Award. And this story is called, What is in your brain is yours and no one else's. I had a very nurturing father with respect to education. My father's maxim was, your worldly possessions can be taken away from you, but what is in your brain is yours and no one else's. And he was extremely supportive, considering that I was a girl. What was also unusual was that my mother died when I was just 14 or 15. We had a very unpleasant traditional aunt who made it clear that she was sacrificing to come and tend to the house, to the house cleaning and all that. Oh yeah, assisting, making sure that we all understood how much she was doing for us. But I remember overhearing a conversation where she was trying to persuade my father to send me to secretarial school, that it was a waste of money to send a girl to college. I was in tears. My father, after she had left, said, what's bothering you? What's the matter? And I said, well, I want to go to college very badly. And he says, of course you're going to college. And I said, but aunt is against it. And he said, well, have I listened to her before? So a very nurturing father who was very proud of my achievements and my first book I dedicated to him. So you can see the role of the father there. She was really at a turning point where she almost was, felt like she might have to give up because uh, some of her support infrastructure, her aunt was against her pursuing higher education, but her father said, no, look, you're going to do this, you know, whether the aunt supports or not, we're going to, uh, we're going to move forward and you're going to be well-educated and, and you're, you're going to be, uh, you know, amazing in science. Uh, now another story, uh, or, uh, just, just kind of a memory I, I, uh, uncovered was from Ray Kurzweil. And this story is called confirmation that I was on the right path. I didn't need a lot of encouragement. I had some mentors who were really very encouraging because they saw that I was creative. And so there were some teachers. I mean, I don't uh, remember all that many people's names from junior high school or high school, but my math teacher in seventh grade and also eighth grade and ninth grade, Miss Matwell, she was very enthusiastic about my computer projects because I was building computers in junior high school. I remember her. And then there was the physics teacher, Mr. Uh, Rabin Rabinowitz. He was Jacob Rabinowitz, Mr. Ewan. He was also my math teacher in high school, and they and they encouraged me. He kind of mentored me when I was doing my Westinghouse science uh, talent search project to see how, uh, uh, as part of the, the the science talent search, that's how I got to meet uh, President Johnson. Uh, and I'll, I'll just skip it ahead a little bit, um, and. Uh, well, I, I, I think that's enough. So, uh, so you can see that the, the geniuses uh, now are sort of in fully formed adult mode and they're driving progress forward. But they had these experiences as, as children that um, helped to create the foundation for their confidence and their creativity and, and helped to allow them to shine and express their creativity. And actually I have a bit of a metaphor that's illuminating. So – when I, when I was hearing these stories and I was looking at the patterns in the stories of, of how the mentors contributed to the genius's education and inspiration and confidence, uh, I thought of um, a quote I heard about Michelangelo. And Michelangelo, of course, is the great uh, sculptor, uh, sculptor artist. Uh, and, and he described the process of creating his great uh, pieces of art. And he would say he would take the marble and instead of <clears throat> creating a, a, a sculpture – out of that marble, he would really just look at that marble and, and, and look for the sculpture already hidden within the stone itself, the, the, the marble, that, that was created by the, the earth the, through the cracks and ridges. And it was his job as the artist to just brush away almost sand from, from that sculpture that was already hidden within the, the marble. And, and so in the same way, these geniuses – through their DNA and through who they are sort of biologically um, and also perhaps their nurture as well, of course, 
there, there are already geniuses within, but then these, these mentors and educators and teachers help to form who they are as geniuses by just brushing away um, the sand from the stone. And so, so the, the, the geniuses need role models and mentors. Uh, and, and so that should make us all feel empowered that we can help contribute to, 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 uh, to form geniuses for the future. And, and of course, these geniuses will drive progress forward in technology and, and lead us towards the singularity. That's fascinating, Greg. So we are approaching uh, towards the end of our interview today. And I would like to ask you, where can our viewers and listeners go and find more information both about you and about your book today? Absolutely. Uh, so I created a website called GeniusStory.com. So that's only one S, like Genius Story. And that has uh, some, some, a few stories from my, my book on the webpage. It has a slideshow of some of the geniuses like Ray Kurzweil, Bob Metcalf, Rita Colwell, um, Vint Cerf, Tim Berners-Lee. And, uh, and then there's also a link to buy the book, and then you can see the genius theory, uh, my big idea, this, this recipe for genius of how to uh, – like a blueprint to create the next generation of geniuses and technology. Uh, so that, that's probably the best way. You can also go on Amazon and, and buy the book. I, I, I believe it's also on the iPad and the Kindle. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And I, of course, would post links to those. Uh, finally, do you have a single message – the most important thing that you would like our viewers and listeners to take away from your, your interview today, what would that Absol be? Absolutely. So I, I, uh, I was at the Singularity Summit in San Jose in 2008, I believe it was. And after the summit, I was out on the patio and I, I was with Ray Kurzweil and I, I looked into his eyes and I said, Ray, I... I, I agree with the ideas you're saying. Clearly, there are exponential technology or exponential trends in technology. Like, look at Moore's law, and you know, now nowadays we have the iPhone. Who would have imagined that uh, f just five years ago? And uh, but and I and I asked Ray, why why are you talking about this? Why are you talking about the singularity? Because I'm I'm not as sort of extroverted as as he is in a way about talking about these ideas. And he said. Uh, and, and, you know, wh why are you talking about it? Why don't you just take this knowledge and go invent and create new technologies and be an amazing entrepreneur, which he is an amazing entrepreneur and amazing inventor. But he said, Greg, it's important to talk about the singularity because many people out in the world don't understand. They don't have this vision of, of where technology is going. And it's important for them to, to, to be able to imagine and understand uh, where the technology is headed towards the singularity because – we have so many problems in the world, and I referred to this earlier, like global warming and the energy crisis, you know, bioterrorism. And a lot of people get depressed. They just get down in the dumps, sad about these problems, and they feel almost helpless and victimized. And he said, with these technologies, we can solve these problems, but we have to be smart about how we do it. And it, and, and it doesn't, doesn't just happen. It's not inevitable. We, we will it to happen. These, these technologies are created by human beings. And so he wants to share this vision of the singularity with the world because they, they need to have that first blueprint in their mind of where we could be and how we could solve these problems with the technology. And, and, and that will help us steer our efforts in the right directions instead of getting sort of victimized and down the dumps. Or, you know, we could, we could be spending all day bridge, uh, building bridges and, and dams to try to hold back the ocean from, you know, consuming our cities. But, you know, instead, you know, we might be able to have an artificial tree and, and take, take out the carbon dioxide with our technologies, but be smart about it so we don't uh, screw things up worse. Um, and so, uh, so my big idea for, for the readers and for, uh, for the listeners now is just that it's important to understand the singularity and, and, and the exponential trends of technology – but then also feel the sense of empowerment that I can do something about this. It's not just inevitable or I'm not a victim, but I can help shape the world in, in the positive directions. Like, like Steve Jobs, you know, he, he took Apple from – it was about to go out of business to now it's the most valuable company in the world to my knowledge. And now we have the iPhone and the iPad and, and that's, that's changing the world. So, um, so it's, it's, it's really the sense of you, know, you can do it. Uh, you should feel empowered as an individual to help improve the world and 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 a technology and, and inventing new technologies is a great way to do it because it has such a high leverage uh, uh, sort of amplification effect 
on, 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 on your impact for positive change. Greg Vienches, thank you very much for spending time with us today. Thank you, Socrates. Glad to be here. Thank you.